All right, welcome to Real Estate Success. I'm your host, Mina Badros, here today with Aaron Gray. Aaron, uh, great to have you, sir. Thanks for having me, sir. For sure. Hi, uh, before we dive into real estate, I'd love for people just to learn a little bit about who you are. Uh, so without mentioning any professional accomplishments, can you tell people who our Aaron Gray is? Aaron Gray is a husband, he is a father, he is a son, he is an author, um, real estate professional, minister, pastor, preacher, speaker, teacher. So, <laughs> I mean, there's there's a lot of titles that, that go with who I am. Cool. So one title, uh, you know, is the minister of real estate. So just uh, curious, how did that get, came about? That's, that's a cool question, and I get that a lot. So for me, as a minister as a Christian, as a preacher, I never wanted to have the association with me as a minister. So I always tried to separate them. But one day during a role play, uh, I got locked in the corner because I asked a closed ended question. <laughs> then I turned to my broker and said, see, this is where I have a problem. I don't want to be pushy. And my Jewish broker looked at me, didn't blink. She says, let me ask you a question. In your ministry, are there times that you have to help people get to a different level of understanding that they would not get to without you? I said, sure. Her words, then you need to put on your minister's hat. You need to become the minister of real estate. And when she said that, it was like this light bulb went off. Here I was trying to separate it but it's part of who I am. And something that the Lord shared with me in that is when I'm trying to separate that part of myself, I'm robbing my clients of the true essence of who I am. The other thing was I come across as being disingenuous because I'm not fully being myself. I'm not being my authentic self. Even though it wasn't something negative, the ingenuineness was what was being communicated to clients. So that's my brand story. Awesome, man. So, I mean, I have a few follow-up questions on that. First, uh, you said the kind of a light bulb went off, right? So the, the minister of real estate, that means something to you. Uh, it, it embodies something, the way you carry yourself in your business. Uh, can you unpack that kind of uh, for us a little bit? Right. So as a minister, which is you know what I do, that's my calling in life. I, I am a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and I'm not ashamed of that. Now, I don't badger people with that, but I believe that we should all have freedom of expression. And it seems that everybody has their freedom of expression until you start talking religion. Mm -hmm. But for me, it's who I am. It's what I do. Like I say, I don't beat people up with it, but I'm not ashamed of it. And I don't back down just like anybody would in their ordinary conversation, talk about their parents, talk about their football team. That's part of my conversation. And I speak about it as if it's a normal part of my conversation. You know, some people get offended. That's not my problem. I, I'm not attempting to be offensive, but heck, people get offended because I dress nice. People get offended because I look good. So I can't be upset about that. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, you know, you mentioned something like being yourself and freedom of expression. And I think uh, coming into the real estate industry, a lot of people try to see what's working, right? Mm -hmm. And do things that maybe that doesn't really embody who they are, right? Yeah, um, right. You know, how can someone kind of come into the business or have been in the business, um, find themselves more or bring themselves more into, into the profession, if that makes sense? It does. And I have a story regarding that as well. My brokerage, we're really big on prospecting, calling FISBOs, calling expired listings. Two things I don't do. And so here it is. This is what, what the trend is. Right. Where I've come into the business and I don't do it. But yet for the last eight years running, I've been the top agent in my office. And so I'm not saying that to brag, but just to say that you have to cut your own cloth. So here, here's something else I've developed. People follow the blueprint. I follow the gray print. Mm, did you, like did you catch that? Yeah. Aaron Gray, I the like gray what print. You did there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you have to be comfortable in knowing who you are. And as long as what you're doing is working, they can't argue with you. 
You're not breaking any rules. You're, you're following the program as far as what the rules and regulations say we can and cannot do. And just be comfortable in being that. I didn't want to have the, the minister associated with me because I didn't want to turn people off. But I find that I've done business with people of different faith. I've done people with things that, well, let me, let me say this the right way. People of the LGBTQ plus, I think I got it all. I've done business with folks in that, in that realm. And you would think as a minister, knowing what the Bible teaches and preaches, that I would be someone that is anti them, which is not the case. What they do in their private life versus what real estate says are two different things. And so their lifestyle does not preclude them from owning a house. And I will represent them. I will go to bat for them. I will advocate with them for them because they are coming to me as a real estate professional to buy a home. And they meet the criteria for buying a home. The only thing that prevents me from helping somebody for buying a home is their financial status. If they're broke folk, I can't help them. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> well, I'm curious, why did you get into real estate? So I was in the cleaning industry since 16. And I came to the conclusion that the cleaning industry was basically a second career and people were given a second career commitment. So I really didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. I didn't want to go back to school, put all this money into education and then turn around and hear God say, I want you to do this. So real estate was something that I could do, didn't take a whole lot of money, didn't take a whole lot of time. So I figured I would get into real estate part time. So in 2008, my wife had taken her classes, two cousins had taken their classes. Well, not in 2008, but prior to that time, but it was 2008 when I decided to do it. So I figured I'll get into real estate, do it part time. But in a dream, God told me to do real estate full time. 2008, market is crashing. I said, are you serious? What a great I had the right? same what a great entry point. Right. I had the same dream the next night. So needless to say, my path in real estate has been a divine appointment. Everything that has transpired in my career has had a divine influence, even coming to my current company. When the broker started recruiting me, I was like, nope, I'm good. I don't want to join your company. God said, go to lunch with her. All right, fine. I went to lunch. I heard everything she had to say. It sounded great, but I wasn't ready to leave. So on my fourth meeting, I went into the office. My plan was to tell this lady, leave me alone. Stop calling me. Stop texting me. Stop emailing me. I'm not joining your company. But when I sat in her office, I saw all the gold statues. I literally thought she was Academy Award winning actress. I saw all the statues and I saw all of the accoutrements of her success. And then I said, well, you can learn from her. And here comes God again. He says, nobody knows Aaron Gray. Nobody knows your little company. This company can open doors for you. So that day I joined the company. When I went to the corporate office to get processed, I had tears in my eyes. And I heard God impress upon me, you are home. That was in July of 15, 16. I became the top listing agent in the office. That was my first full year. I doubled my production from the first seven years. My second year, which was 17, I tripled my production and I've maintained that designation of the top agent in the office. Since that time, I've obtained my broker's license, my New Jersey license. I'm a real estate instructor. I've written a book. So I just see that real estate is a space for me, not just to buy and sell houses, but to help other people buy and sell houses, as well as become a voice in the real estate space. Awesome. I mean, I, I love it. Um, kudos to you. And um, thank you for sharing the, the evolution of your real estate with us in a nutshell. I was going to ask you about that. Um, but let me ask in 2015, 2016, right? Coming off the, the new brokerage, mm -hmm. uh, had a very successful first year there. What happened or what did you do to, to have that, that success and then kind of continue to uh, improve it from there? That's an interesting thing because <laughs> when I first got into real estate, I really wasn't focused on real estate. I tell folks I was a bum in my first seven years. 
And the reason I say that, because in seven years, I sold 41 homes. So if you do the math, that's six homes a year. That's above average, I think, if you split it per year. That's below average. Oh, okay. <laughs> 12, 12 transactions. That's what the average agent sells. So I was half an agent. <laughs> but I was doing BPOs. I was doing a ton of BPOs. I was doing about 300 of them every month. So I was wow. making six figures just doing BPOs. But in 2017, BPOs were doing like this and my sales were doing like this. And so I started looking at that. Then years later, I started asking myself, well, what were the key things that you did that helped you to have your success? And again, I'm not a mega agent. I'm above average because again, 12 transactions is the average transactions that a person does in a year, an agent does in a year. There's some people that do 12 homes a month. I'm not at that level, but I'm at a level that I never thought I would be at. So I looked at what was it that I did? And that's where the, the book, Five Keys to Becoming an Above Average was born. Branding, uh, sphere of influence, social media, uh, video, and consistent follow-up. Those were the primary areas that I had been doing. The only thing that really changed primarily was the social media and the video. Those were the two biggest game changers for my real estate career. Awesome. I love that. And uh, you started talking about your book. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about that? Right. So I'm actually in the process of redoing it. I wrote the book in 2021, Five Keys to Becoming an Above Average Agent. I didn't do anything with the book. I did a digital version because I wanted people to have it in their hand quickly. So a lot of things about the book, it was it's eight chapters because eight is a number of new beginnings. Three, talk about my backstory of how I got into real estate. And then you have the five keys. All of these things are connected to spirituality. So three, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Five, a number of grace. So eight is a new beginning. Once you read this book, you should and implement these things. You should have a new beginning in your real estate career. I wrote it to a specific group of people. And the reason I'm redoing it because I'm adding a subtitle. So the subtitle is how to earn your first six figures in real estate. So I want people to know that when they read this book, this is what this book is designed to help you accomplish. I'm going to actually do a hard copy this time. I'm going to do the digital book as well as an audio book so that I can help that core group of people. Again, I'm not trying to make people multimillionaires. I'm trying to make them above average. And again, if we look at what the stats say, an average agent is only earning 56.4 per year. Mm -hmm. So if I get you to six figures, you're double above average. So that's my goal. And I mean, I would argue it could uh, even expand above that, right? I think it, it's a matter of uh, doing the right things, the fundamental things consistently, right? And doing it at a, at a high level or being able to scale that. So implementing the same things, uh, just doing more of it and doing more consistently, I would argue that you can, you can get above that. Or if you're doing Absolutely. that already, uh, you can even do more, right? Absolutely. Uh, depending on what you have going on. Awesome. I love it. What are you um? Where are you currently spending your time on right now, as far as real estate is concerned? You know, as your kind of career has evolved. So my my career now is moving more into the education space, uh, moving into coaching, moving into mentoring. Uh, one looking at doing some keynote speaking at real estate events, uh, looking into brokerage ownership. So those are some of the things that are expanding. So the actual sales piece is going to take a dramatic change. It hasn't happened yet, but I know that as I dive into those other areas more, then the sales are going to take a back seat. Now, I don't see my sales just automatically slowing down because of my presence. I got a call today from a church member who's with another agent, but is having problems. So now you're calling me. And I'm thinking in the back of my head, if you had come to me first, you wouldn't be having these problems. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Right. But I still gave them help. You know, it's like you're calling out to me. I'm going to give you the help that I can give you. So that's where I am right now. Awesome. 
Um, if you were starting your real estate career all over again, what would you uh, focus on? Uh, and considering like the current market, current technology, current economy, all of that stuff, what would you focus on right now if you were a brand new agent? The first thing I would focus on is making sure I had money in reserves. Mm -hmm. The beautiful thing for me is I have a wife that also works. So because my wife works, I wasn't, I didn't have the pressure to perform and to bring that, that income in. I mean, I, I had to do it because romance without finance is a nuisance <laughs> is what Big Daddy Kane said. But I would make sure I had that money and then I would make sure I was set up properly. I would make sure that I had all of the things in place to run a business. Jared James says, either you're going to run a business or you're going to run around. And many agents are running around because they don't have their business set up properly. So they don't know what to do. It's like you get your license. You want to go out and start selling homes. Yeah. No, 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 no. Pump the yeah. brakes. Make sure your business is set up properly. So when that business starts coming in, you have repeatable stuff that you can do. You have those tools. You have those systems set up. You have that intake questionnaire. You have your CRM. You have your buyer's presentation, your seller's presentation. You're asking those same questions to build rapport with those people so that you can earn their trust and they'll hire you to do business with them. Yeah, yeah. I, I love that. You know, I um, a lot of times in, in trainings, I kind of... Uh, tell people the story of a lot of agents come into business and they're looking for the first check and they get that first check. Uh, and then, you know, they get busy, right? People call them, they're, they're out there, they're running around, they're active, they're making money, which feels good. Right. And it's fulfilling right. financial obligations. Uh, but then they never really actually sat down and took time to set up the business. And at some right. point they feel the impact of that roller coaster. Right. And it's like, oh, I maybe I should have done this. Right. So it's um, it's great. Right. To, to get all this activity and the checks and the transactions. Uh, but if you never really set up a business, uh, you, you said it perfectly well. You'll end up just running around, not running a business. Right. Yeah. And I think we've all been there to some extent as as agents. You know, but the, the more you dig into it, like I say, for me, the first seven years, I don't know how I got any business <laughs> because literally, Mina, I felt like I was a fraud. I was scared if somebody would ask me a question about that contract because I wasn't getting the necessary training that I needed. And so I felt like a fish out of water. But then when I came where I am now, I'm surrounded by people who are not just doing real estate, but they are sitting on the boards of the organizations. One of the partners in the company is the president of PAR. So these are the people that I vacation with. You know what I mean? These are the people that I have meetings with. You know, my direct broker and our CEO, well, my direct broker is a real estate commissioner. You know, has sat on different committees, the forms committees and the different committees at the local level, the state level and the national level. So these are the people that I'm surrounded by now so I have a greater appreciation for the business, not just the sale portion, but behind the scenes. Even the class that you took, the real estate negotiations, you know, yeah. you need to know how to do those things. And so all of the education piece is critical for me because I was so deficient. I, I, I'm dubbing myself, in addition to being the minister of real estate, I am the ambassador of real estate education. <laughs> so mm. that's my other title. <laughs> Yeah, I, I love that. And, you know, talking about education, I was just um, talking with another agent. I think there is a ton of training out there in real estate. There's almost an overwhelmness of training now. Um, but the issue with that, again, I think overwhelming is an issue. Uh, people don't know the right trainings. They don't get the right trainings at the right time. Mm -hmm. It's not emphasized enough. I think there's not enough structure, right? Uh, there is a ton of trainings, but there's not really a roadmap. Um, what's your kind of observation and perspective on, on that as far as just the industry is concerned? I think in the industry, we, as, as the saying goes, we are drinking from a fire hose. Every day our inboxes are packed with 
this master class, that master class. And we preach education, education, education. So agents say, oh, I'm gonna jump into the education. I'm gonna jump into the education. I'm gonna jump into the education. And you get so much information, but you can't implement it all. And that's why in the book, I said five things. Find some things that you can master and do those well before you move on to something else. One of the things people talk about is niches in real estate. I never had a real estate niche, but I'm digging into one now because it's one that I found that I actually like. And it's not a crowded space, which is estate sales. A lot of people don't want to do estate sales. It's a lot of hard work at times. And you're dealing with death and you're dealing with a whole bunch of different things. But I've done so many estate sales and I have a great real estate attorney. It doesn't make any sense not to make it my niche. Actually, I have two real estate attorneys that I work with. Right. So uh, you've done a lot of things in real estate and you mentioned quite a few roles uh, that you're doing now and have done. What do you enjoy the most if you could uh, pick one or narrow it down? The teaching and training and equipping of other agents, whether it's new agents or it's seasoned agents, because one of the classes I teach for our association is problem solving and conflict resolution. One size does not fit all. It's a mandatory class for our association. And you know, when you do mandatory classes, people always think I've been doing this for 25 years. I've been doing this for 40 years. What can you tell me? And I, I normally start off the class like this. I know you all have this. You ain't the boss of me. You don't tell me what to do. I said, but let me ask you, how many of you know how to walk? And everybody raises their hand and says, yes. I said, so have any of you ever tripped since you've learned to walk? And then the class goes quiet. What are you tripping for? You've been walking for 40 years, 60 years, however, whatever age you are. You should not be tripping because you learned how to walk when you were a baby. And then they make the correlation most times. And then you just have some people that just are going to be ornery, regardless of what you say and regardless of what you do. Awesome. Uh, you mentioned earlier kind of uh, where you're heading, right? And uh, you mentioned a few things, but kind of what's next for you and what are you uh, kind of uh, focused on? Specifically? In, in real estate, right? So with real estate, Again, looking at brokerage ownership, that's something that I'm, I have right up here in, in the forefront, uh, building my, my speaking, teaching, training. So that's what the class, uh, the Facebook group that I have now, like I say, I did that two years ago and did nothing with it. And this, this week, I've decided that it's time to do something with it. So immediately, I'm working on the revision of the book. I'm working on, uh, again, moving towards brokerage ownership and working on building that, that speaker platform as well as training. Because I, I'm, like I said, I'm teaching for a couple of, I'm teaching for the association now. And I've had a couple opportunities to teach to independent brokerages, which is lovely. And I, I that's my happy space. When I get on the stage, when I get in the room, when I get the opportunity to teach folks, I, I enjoy that space. Awesome. I, I love it. I mean, I can, I can relate as well. I was about to say, you, you can relate to that because this is yeah. what you do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll have to talk more about that later. But um, what would you say is one thing that impacted or had the biggest impact on your real estate career as an agent? The thing that had the biggest impact on my real estate career as an agent was joining the current brokerage that I'm at. Okay. Why, why is that? And that's not necessarily about the brokerage, but um, just why was that for you? For me, because again, I went from no oversight, no structure, as you mentioned, not saying that the people didn't have stuff because they did. But when I got here, it was a night and day difference from what I experienced the first seven years. Mm. Just being able to have a business plan. What are your goals for next year? How much money do you want to make next year? How are you going to do that? Are you going to focus on buyers? Or are you going to focus on sellers? Where are those buyers and sellers going to come from? Are they going to come from open houses? Are they going to come from social media? Are they going to come from cold calls? Are they going to come from sign calls? What's the uh, fallout rate? So all of these things, being able to, to put that together to say, this is what I want to do next year, and this is how I'm going to do it. And then again, being around people that 
inspire you, people that motivate you, people that believe in you, even when you might not have believed in yourself. So those were the things that made the change for me. Being, I wasn't a realtor. I was a real estate agent. I was a licensee until I came here because I bought the lie. You pay that fee to say that you abide by the code of ethics. That was the only thing that was touted about being a realtor. But that is so much hogwash. There's so much more than the code of ethics. So there, there's a lot of benefits that come with that. Absolutely. RPAC. That's another one that I knew nothing about. Right. But if you're in real estate, then politics is your business. We know that the Realtor Political Action Committee does a lot of things that helps our industry and it helps homeowners. But you won't know that unless you get into pe get around people that are talking about it, people that are promoting it. So coming here, the associations I've made and the people that I've been surrounded by, those were the biggest changes for me. Awesome. I, I love that. And I heard a few things, kind of having a business plan, right? Like knowing mm -hmm. what you're going to do, how you're going to do it, the, and the activities that you're going to commit to, and also surrounding yourself by the right right people, right support, right environment. And I think um, a lot of Asians kind of dismiss those things, right? They overlook those things, especially like the plan, right? Mm -hmm. Like I think every brokerage or every association has business planning clinics, right? And um, but how many agents actually have a plan and actually stick to it and, and do the work that's required? Right. Um, I think a smaller percentage than what we would like to, to see, right? Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Um, what would you say to current agents or seasoned agents, maybe that are struggling or are seeing a decline in their sales uh, because of market conditions or whatever the reasons may, may be? I would say to them, don't throw in the towel. We've lost 60,000 agents since May of this year. It was estimated that 600,000 would leave the business. I don't wow. think we're going to see 600,000 leave unless not. between now and, and uh, December, we have a mass exodus. But I would say, come back, regroup, take a look at where you are. It's like anything else. What's working? What's not working? What am I good at? What am I not good at? What do I need to change? So take an evaluation, take an assessment of your business. You know, for me, last year was a was a big change year for me. Last year, I think I might have did 10 buyers mm -hmm. only. That was a huge change for me. Not that I don't like buyers, but I'm, I'm more of a seller's agent as far as volume. But I like this. I like closings with buyers better in the sense of they're achieving that dream. They're firing their landlord in many instances or for a seller that's getting a monkey off their back. Like they've got a property that they couldn't sell or, you know, they inherited a property. So those are good feeling types of closings. But to that agent that may be struggling, evaluate where you are. Evaluate what you did. And a lot of times we're listening to all of the noise. Like I did a video today that talked about the interest rates. Everybody's screaming and up in arms about the interest rate. Well, if you go back and look at the interest rate from 1971 to 2023, the average rate for 30-year mortgage in the U.S. is 7.74%. Mm. In 1981 of October, the highest rate was 18.6%. 18.63%. July of 21, we saw the lowest, 2.65%. And what's happening is everybody's focusing on the 2.65%. Right. And they're saying, <laughs> oh, the market, the market. Well, why don't you look back at 1981 when it was 18.63% and say, whoa, we killing it, 7.74%. <laughs> then look at your card note. Look at your credit interest. Look at those interest rates. Why are you not up in arms about them? 29% on your credit card. Everybody's not paying that full amount every month. So when we look at those things, don't listen to all of that stuff. Get in your own lane and find out what's working for you. What works for you is not going to work for me. And what works for me may not work for you. So we have to know what we're good at and what our goal is, what our role is. You can't look at the next man's lawn 
and determine how green your grass is supposed to be. You don't know how much they water that grass. You don't know what ingredients they put in there. You don't even know if it's AstroTurf. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing that. I would love to uh, ask you as we wrap up about your big message to real estate professionals. But before we get there, I want to ask you, what has worked for you as the agent? Like uh, what pillars did you focus on? You said, you know, it wasn't expired. It wasn't physicals. Uh, what is it that you focused on that kind of helped you succeed on the sales side? Social media and video. Those are the two, those are the game changers. Those are the field levelers. My largest client, I have a client who's actually a friend and they are well connected. And I they're both in human resources. So I know they know a lot of people, but yet when they went to buy a house, they contacted me. I was surprised. And I asked, I said, so help me understand, what was it that made you select me as your agent of choice when you know so many people? And the client said very simply, it was your social media. Every time I turned around, there you were. So you stayed top of mind. So I helped them to buy one house here. Then the following year, they bought another home. Then they turned around that same home that they bought. We sold it within a year and they made a ton of money. <clears throat> I think we bought it. <clears throat> excuse me. We bought it for like $6.85. A year and a half later, they sold it for $9.25. That's a great, great profit percentage there. <laughs> Humongous. <laughs> so with that one person, from social media, I did three transactions and over $2 million in volume, sales volume. For one person. From one person from social media. That's awesome. Well, on the speaking side, uh, I look forward to seeing you graze the stages around the country and the world. I'm excited for you for that. Thank you. Um, what is your big message to real estate professionals? Stay focused, stay committed, we're in an industry that does like this. And when you know that's how it goes, then you prepare. You know what you did last year. If you did 100,000, then divide that by 12 and make that your budget for every month. Some months you're going to have more than that. Some months you're not going to have as much. So make sure that you stay focused, stay committed, make the necessary changes if you're not getting the results you want, but only do that after taking inventory. Don't get all bent out of shape about all of the noise that you hear. You got to weed some of that stuff out and just stay focused. There's only one person in your lane, and that's you. Awesome. Well, sir, Mr. Aaron Gray, thank you so much uh, for blessing us with your time and your knowledge. Much appreciated, and uh, hopefully we'll do this again. Much appreciated, man. Thanks for having me. Until the next time. Thank you. Have a good one. You too, sir. Peace and blessings.